welcome to i -Corps webinar on resilience is more than a plan, it is a strategy. And um, I am Linda, N let me get that to go. I am Linda Nelson and i -Corps president and I will be presenting for you today. Um, I do serve at the US TAG and as the i -Corps liaison for ISO Technical Committee um, 292 on security and resilience, including um, on the ISO 22316 on organizational resilience principles and attributes. I'm also the author of i -Corps Certified Organizational Resilience Series. So we're gonna continue today with our series that we've been covering since January about um, kind of recovering from the pandemic. And so today we're going to talk specifically about how you can learn to contribute to building your organization's sustainable capabilities as a strategy instead of planning for kind of a return to normal after the COVID crisis ends. Um, this is a topic that is one of those things that you, people say you maybe get on a soapbox about, but um, this whole idea of having an, a resilience plan will tend to get me up and, and telling you all about how it's a strategy and not a plan. So that I'm kind of excited today to be able to be on my soapbox and, and share with you why um, organizational resilience needs to be delivered as a strategy or a series of strategies. Just a reminder that this being this webinar is being recorded and we should have it available on the i -Corps webinar page on our website. Um, usually it's the next day, but I'll just say in two days just to be safe. If you have questions, um, please use the questions button. I will take questions at the end and if we do run out of time or don't get all them answered, um, we will answer them after the webinar. If you attend um, at least 35 minutes, then you will get a certificate of attendance so that you can use that for CEUs or whatever else that you need. So I just wanna start with what is, what is organizational resilience? And this is a slide that I use often because I never know exactly if this is the first time that you're attending one of our webinars or if you've been attending all along. But I just want to look at the definition, which is the ability of an organization to absorb and adapt in a changing environment. And then it goes on to say, because you want to enable it to deliver its, its objectives and to survive and prosper and understanding that more resilient organizations are able to anticipate and respond to threats and opportunities arising from both sudden and gradual changes in your internal and external context. One of the things that the ISO definition does is it combines the, com the importance of being prepared with the strengthening of the organization's overall capabilities, combined with that understanding of itself and its relationship with others. And so one of the things I hope that you'll get out of today's webinar is that we're talking about more than operational um, resilience or more than about managing risk, although that is an important aspect of this. Just a starting point is, you know, just like anything else, building a more resilient organization needs to be intentional which means it needs to be a strategic initiative. It needs to be part of your, st your strategy as an organizational goal. And of course, this means that your leaders must be committed to a sustained focus on organizational resilience because it is not a project, it is not a plan. It is a strategy that requires a sustained focus. And we know that organizational resilience is enhanced when that organization intentionally implements strategies to increase resilience. It doesn't happen all by itself. So you need to be doing things to increase your resilience and reduce your risk. And of course, the behavior of leadership is going to be a key contributor to how the organization implements these strategies. And it is really rooted in that understanding of itself and its relationship with others. And of course, it is also top management's responsibility to demonstrate um, to demonstrate responsibility for both the governance and the accountability um, of the organizational resilience capability itself. The i -Corps organizational resilience model was developed as an output from ISO 22316, where we looked at attributes and principles. And so out of that came these three dimensions, leadership and strategy, culture and behaviors and preparedness and managing risk. From that, we also have nine strategies. So three strategies for um, 
each of those three dimensions. So things like a shared vision, understanding the context, having effective leaders, being able to have a healthy culture, one that shares information and, and it focuses on continual improvement. And then under preparedness and managing risk, making sure you have available resources, um, that you're able to manage risk and you're able to manage change because we're talking about times of change and uncertainty. And so um, a lot of times change and uncertainty helps to drive risk to your organization as well. So our organizational resilience model is also helping to drive some of the content for this webinar today, combined with our organizational resilience capability assessment that has um, a bit more detail where we have driven, instead of three dimensions, we have five dimensions. So we're looking at, again, leadership and strategy, your culture and behaviors. We're also looking at how your organization is structured. So organizational infrastructure, both for the workplace as well as the workforce. Um, we just did webinars on April and May on those two topics. And then looking at preparedness and managing risk as well as continual improvement. As part of that, we've identified 17 strategies and some of those we're going to talk about today. And to support those strategies, we've identified 95 capabilities that should be in place that, so that your organization can demonstrate um, its different resilience um, attributes and capabilities itself. But in addition to those, we've also identified behaviors. So in our organizational resilience model, we had, I believe, 12 behaviors. And just because of trying to do a measurement of those behaviors, we've combined many of those behaviors so that we have six behaviors combinations that we're measuring um, in order to see how your organizational behaves because it's not just about the what organizational resilience is also about the how so when we're planning for this post pandemic future you know one of the things that we need to understand is that the pressure to change has been going on for years you know well before the pandemic and executives were talking about, we're too slow, we're too siloed, we're too bogged down, we're too bureaucratic. And so now is, is the time where we have an opportunity to really re-energize your people and your organization itself. As we start seeing, depending on what part of the world you're in right now, you know, some parts of the world are, are in a much farther stage of vaccination than others, but as we start coming out of COVID and, and more and more people are vaccinated and we can kind of get back to what we'll call our normal operations, organizations have the opportunity right now to start planning for this post-pandemic future and how can we take advantage of all of the changes that have occurred to come out better than we came into this. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, a lot of leaders feared, and really I think we've had confirmed during this pandemic, is that their companies are organized for a world that's disappearing. You know, we've, we've gone from an era of standardization and predictability, and what we're really seeing is a trend, four new trends that are overriding those, the way things have been. We obviously see a combination of heightened connectivity. People are more connected to each other than they've ever been before. And this means that, you know, the speed of just connecting with people is amazing. And also the impact that we can have on each other is also, can be an upside or a downside. But we have lower transaction costs, which means there's going to be more global competition between our workforces. And so um, this is something that's going to be totally need to be reconsidered as we've looked at the fact um, that we have a workforce in the office space that for the most part can work anywhere at any time. And so what does that look like when now that you can have experts maybe that don't live anywhere near your office actually be contributing? And so this idea that we have a larger workforce to grow from um, and the fact that those people and where they work might have lower transaction costs, so as well as some of the other things with transaction costs as well. But I think that the work workforce is going to start equalizing and we're going to see some changes in that as well as this idea of automation. I mean, with technology changes and all of the, you know, the big data and, and all the automation that we have and blockchain and everything else, um, that is also becoming a great equalizer. And of course, we see shifting demographics as well. 
So one of, one of the things I want to really bring forward today is we have a, what's called, I think, a once in a generation opportunity for change. So as we start transitioning from this kind of crisis mode to what the next new normal looks like, it gives executives a unique opportunity. And so we need to seize on this initiative and start looking at how can we create, if you haven't already started, what I'm not sure, you know, I'm just making kind of facetiously here, but a little bit, I, you can't have been in crisis mode this entire time. I, hopefully you've been looking ahead to figure out how can you become less fragile? How can you become more flexible, more organic, more interconnected and more purposeful? And sometimes maybe just simply more human. It has been a time where leadership needs to understand its people and understand what its people have been going through. And that's going to make a difference in how your what your organization looks like in the future and how you behave. And so McKinsey has put out um, a paper where they've talked about you know, nine keys to becoming a future ready company. And one of the things I was really excited about was that that paper overlapped almost consistently with um, our organizational resilience capability assessment and the organizational resilience model as far as the things that we're focusing on. But one of the things they talk about with future ready companies is that, that they tend to share three characteristics. And they looked at 30 different companies that have been very, very successful in the past couple of years. And what they, what they have seen is that those companies that have been successful know who they are and they know what they stand for. What are we here for? And they operate with this fixation on speed combined with simplicity. And, they're and they focus on how they grow by scaling up on their ability to learn, to innovate, and to seek good ideas regardless of their origin. And so what we know is that if you haven't started, you really don't have any time to lose because the gap between those companies that are more resilient and the ones that are less resilient is growing every day. And one of the things that they found is that um, up to 95% of economic profit is now being earned by the top 20% of companies. So if you're not looking at new approaches, um, it is time for you to do so. So let's get started with looking at strategies. The first thing you need to do is to really strengthen your identity because they said that those organizations that are successful know who they are and they know what they do. And so one of this is really is understanding that people long to belong and they wanna be part of something bigger than themselves. So that when you create a strong identity that meets your employees' needs for affiliation and social cohesion and purpose and meaning, you're going to be more resilient than those that don't. So what you need to do is take a stance on your purpose. Purpose helps attract people to join an organization and remain there and stay there and thrive. So they know when that organization knows who they are and what they stand for, the organization's vision, purpose, and core values really help to provide that coherence and help to provide clarity in decision-making itself. We know that top performing organizations, um, that purpose becomes that differentiating factor. It's really the why of the work and why people are there. And it embodies everything the organization stands for, really from a historical and emotional, social, and a, as well as practical point of view. And so when you hire people, you wanna make sure that they stay there because you're making an investment in people. And so this is part of creating um, you know, your value agenda as well. One of the things is, that's been said is that um, where your talents and your needs of the world's cross, there lies your vocation. And here is where people really become where they wanna be part of organizations that are changing the world. And I think as you look at the younger workforce, um, that is a decision that they're making sometimes over what the kind of, how much money they're making. I was talking to um, a friend of mine the other day and I'm like, you've been at that company for a really long time. You know, you could make a lot of money going, you know, we named a couple of places and she just said, yeah, but I really like working here. I really like working here. I like what my company does and I believe in what it does and I want to support that. And so I think we're seeing that more and more where what a company does um, inspires people to stay at their jobs. And this is where, you know, keeping your people there and attracting the right people to your organization is going to help um, certainly make you more resilient. But it becomes that that purpose becomes that glue that connects employees together with other stakeholders 
and helps them to make decisions. So as part of this, you really need to sharpen your value agenda. And this is where a lot of companies talk about their value agenda, but they, they don't have it really clearly documented. And so you need to articulate where, does, where is value created in your organization? What sets your company apart from the pack? And you know, we, some, you might say, well, this is all part of marketing. Well, it really isn't. It's about who you are and what might propel, propel its success in your future. So an understanding of the organization's context, you know, who they are, what they do, and all of the relationships that you have are really, really important. And so um, this is where you can use that value agenda to help create that understanding, which makes you, which allows you to make more effective strategic decisions about priorities for resilience. One of the things I wanted to apologize is several of you sent in questions that you had that you wanted me to answer during the webinar. And I have to apologize that I just remembered that just now. Um, so I apologize. I will get those questions answered. And so I will share after the webinar when your certificates come out, I will make sure that we have shared both the questions and the answers to that. So my apologies. But the key piece is that more resilient organizations know who they are and what they stand for. And so you need a clearly articulated and understood purpose, vision, and value agenda, which increases that clarity in, your, in those day-to-day -day priorities and in decision-making all across the organization and at all levels of the organization itself. So when you're looking at what are some capabilities to help strengthen your identity, well, the first thing is your, your behavior needs to be aligned to your shared vision and purpose. I mean, this is key, it's number one. And then your organization's strategic and operational goals and objectives need to be supported by those individual goals and objectives, and they need to be aligned to your organization's purpose, vision, and values. You need to have a nice tight box there where all of this is in alignment so everybody understands why you're there and what it is you're trying to accomplish. But at some times, you need to also be able to recognize the need to reflect on and if necessary, revise your organization's purpose, vision, and core values in response to both external and internal changes. This is a time where a lot of organizations have had to um, take a look at who they are in order, a lot of people have called it pivoting, but you need to move because what you're doing right now isn't selling and it's because because of all of the change that we've had and maybe you know driven by this pandemic and so does this become a temporary change or a permanent change and this is where organizations really need to look at what are the opportunities that have come about because of this pandemic and are there marketplace opportunities that we can take advantage of what are some opportunities for things that we've wanted to change for a really long time but we haven't been able to do just because We've been stuck, and so looking at that as well. So we're not saying throw everything out, but what we're saying is having the opportunity to reflect, and so recognizing that need. And this is why it's really important for the organization to have an understanding of itself and its partners, because this allows you to think beyond what are your current activities and to look at strategy and your organizational boundaries. So look outside of those things to see where could we be you also need to maintain strong relationships with your interested parties and really foster collaboration and cooperation at all levels. And then seek out partnerships when needed to deliver on your strategy and help to support the achievement of, of your purpose and objectives. So these are some capabilities that you need to have in place in order to strengthen your identity. You also need to look at always working on your culture. And, you know, see culture as your secret sauce. You know, your main ingredients are specific observable behaviors that employees at all levels adhere to. And your, you know, your organization's culture, we know, provides that sense of identity to its people as well. It also promotes a sense of commitment and reinforces those values of the organization as to why you're here. So in addition to having that, you know, clear purpose and value, you also need to really be able to distinguish yourself by your culture or how you do your work. And of course we know, you know, culture is about your behaviors, your rituals, your symbols and all of those things, but really how you work. And so we know that culture 
forms the backbone of any organization and a healthy culture is going to have a more healthy organization than an unhealthy one. So part of that is using culture to engage your people at all levels. You need to leverage your culture as a tool to build and strengthen trust. When people are engaged, they're going to perform at a higher level as well, and they're not going to leave your organization. So looking at your culture and how you embrace change in order to be more flexible and adaptable and keep your people engaged at all parts of your organization. You also need to foster learning. So you need to be an organization that fosters learning, creativity, and innovation. This is really an important aspect as well because if you have a culture that blames for mistakes, you're not gonna go very far. And this is not gonna be a very healthy culture. So you need to value error reporting and learning over blame. You need to have a culture where people feel comfortable saying, you know what, we think we have a problem here. We need to stop and take a look at it. Or even a culture that says, we want you to spend you know, a certain amount of your time just learning. So we're going to set aside 20% of your, you know, of every day or 20% of your week where we want you to focus on learning and being more creative and then producing out of that some innovation that can help us to grow. To do that, you have to have a culture that values their reporting, obviously. And, and then if you do make a mistake, seeing how can we learn from that and encourage your people to communicate their ideas both vertically and horizontally in the organization. And of course, you need to be uh, you know, as flat as you can or decentralized as you can in order to be able to have those communication nodes because you need it to have an organization where knowledge and information is widely shared and learning from others is also encouraged. So we know that more, that more resilient organizations demonstrate a commitment to a healthy culture where there is a commitment to an existence of shared beliefs, values, positive attitudes, and behavior. And really a healthy organizational culture serves as a control mechanism for shaping behavior as well. But a key factor of culture is the behavior of your organization's leadership. They are a key contributor as to how an organization implements its organizational resilience strategies, and this is going to be rooted in its understanding of both itself and its relationship with others. Leadership is pretty much responsible for creating a culture that fosters creative creativity as well as innovation. And we, where leaders are seen as effective, trusted, respected, and, those, and, and who act with integrity. You know, having trusted leaders, especially during a crisis like this pandemic, where everything is so uncertain, is something that you can't even measure the importance of. It is a cornerstone of everything that your organization does. So you need your organization's leaders to develop and encourage others to lead under a range of conditions and circumstances, including during these periods of uncertainty and disruption. You need an organization that develops leaders to improve their emotional intelligence and how well they adapt to changing circumstances. You also need to make sure that leadership is distributed throughout the organization and that leaders at all levels are empowered to make decisions that protect and enhance the resilience of the organization. They need to feel like they own that. And leaders of the organization need to demonstrate responsibility for the governance and accountability of its resilience um, capability itself. So rebuild or building for speed and agility, I believe was the topic of our February webinar where we really talked about how you can become more, you know, more speedy and more agile. But we all recognize that our operating models need to be fast and nimble and frictionless in order to create ways of working that foster agility and simplicity. And they need to enable a network of empowered and dynamic teams to find pockets of value, including at the company's edges where your employees are really closest to the customers and they have the most knowledge. And while COVID, has, you know, the COVID crisis itself has made speed a priority for many organizations, what it's really done is reinforced how difficult speed is to harness itself. Um, you know, you need to galvanize your identity, but you also need to optimize for speed. And so 
this is sort of a, a challenge that companies have is that how do you do both of those things? So one of the things you can do is structure your organization for both high performance and managing change. And so adopt models that are designed and nurtured and grown around people and activities. Flatten your infrastructure and your organizational design as much as possible. Design a workplace that is both flexible and productive. We talked last month about the fact that, you know, your workplace is going to look a lot different and, and many more people are going to want to work remotely than there was before. And so um, you're going to need to account for that in your workplace design itself. And you also need to design networks of local cross-functional teams that have clear and functional roles. It's, you know, we really need to expand beyond um, the hierarchical approach. It's, it's really not going to work long-term if you want to be structured for high performance and speed and agility. You also need to think about building for scale. So how can you be prepared to be more nimble and for this constant adaptation if you hope to grow with any consistency? So looking at how can you start smaller and grow to scale? And you can do this by making sure that you've got some constant interaction with your stakeholders, making sure that you're up to date on all of your technology and that you're connected with your employees. And you also need to start looking at what is your ecosystem of partners outside the company's traditional boundaries that you can leverage to help you build for scale. So we know that more resilient organizations demonstrate a commitment to managing change. I mean, a lot of companies are seeing managing change and or actually not managing change as a risk to them. And so looking at using agile change management processes throughout the organization and including all personnel to help with managing change. Traditional change management systems are no longer going to work. And we need to look at how you can use agile change management throughout your organization to help you make decisions more quickly and to evaluate what you have in place. So some of those capabilities that you need, you need to understand how structure and design of the organization impact its agility. You need to structure, you need the organization structure and design to allow its people to collaborate and communicate both horizontally and vertically throughout the organization. And the organization's um, structure and design needs to allow those responsible for providing, um, responsible for responding to and, re and managing an incident to be able to switch from one design to another if needed. So maybe your crisis management structure is different than your normal organizational restructure uh, structure in order to work in a more agile and flexible manner during those times that require it. The organization also should be designed to have shorter chains of command or lines of authority, which will allow you to have more delegation and empowerment. This helps you to operate in as flat a structure as possible, depending on what it is your organization does. You also need to be aware of circumstances that are likely to influence change and demonstrate the ability to anticipate and manage change as it comes. Just to being able to be in front of some of the change is a, is a huge capability. And you need to be able to adapt yourself when needed and without significant impact to the delivery of your products and services. And this is back when we go to this, you know, we've all pivoted. And so how can we still deliver our products and services and adapt ourselves in a way that doesn't compromise who we are and what we stand for? but that draws and produces um, and makes us stronger. I wanted to make sure that we included today the strategy of building a more resilient workforce. This is really top of mind because this world of work is changing so fast. And we know that for years, jobs have been, been replaced by automation. Other, you know, others by, are facilitated by different technology platforms are really becoming more globally dispersed as well. And so these changes are really um, leading many companies to re rethink their whole talent strategy. So when we're looking at building a more resilient workforce, we need to look at what is your talent strategies? Because really talent is one of our um, scarcest resources and we need to think a bit about that. So we know that organizational resilience is enhanced when knowledge is, knowledge is widely shared as appropriate and applied and is recognized as a critical resource of the organization. So we need to treat talent as scarcer than capital and nurturing and retaining your talent whenever possible. One of the statistics that came out of last month's web webinar was something like 60% of people are looking 
to change jobs. And part of that is that nobody changed jobs in 2020 and even in 20, you know, the beginning of 2021, there was such a such a low numbers of people changing jobs compared to normal. So part of that's a natural process, but part of that's also an outcome of the pandemic itself and what people have learned. So you need to nurture and retain your talent. You need to select and develop leaders that have a diversity of skills, capabilities, knowledge, and experience. You need to make sure that you foster an inclusive employee experience and reward and recognize performance to increase engagement as well. And this includes things like wellness and mentoring programs. One of the things that uh, McKinsey's research has found is that companies in the top 25% um, of the race, of the racial and ethnic diversity and gender diversity are um, 30 to 36 percent more likely to have the above average profitability and and respectively um, companies that aren't are in the bottom quartile. So this fostering this diverse employee experience is going to help you nurture and retain talent and to become better at what it is that you do. We talked about learning and providing opportunities for your workforce for learning, but we also need to accelerate learning as an organization itself. This idea of promoting continuous learning that encourages and supports um, people to adapt and reinvent themselves to meet those shifting needs. Talk to people recently that have been at their companies 25 and 35 years, and I've asked, you know, why have you stayed there? And a lot of times it's because they've been able to grow professionally within their organization. It's an organization that they like working for, and because that organization has provided an opportunity for them to learn individually and support the organization's learning as a whole, they have stayed there because the organization has intentionally found places for them to keep them engaged and feeling that they're contributing to what the organization does. And so one of the things that companies need to do is to get learning right. And so this idea of you know failing fast, learn and repeat, um, because versus kind of what we talked about earlier, you know punishing for mistakes. We need to get past that, so that we're supporting people so they can adapt and reinvent themselves as well. And this also this idea of you know looking at a growth mindset and curiosity, where there's an openness to both experimentation and failure, and both of these things really help to accelerate learning both as an organization and the individuals within that. We know that traditional educational ed, um, institutions themselves cannot deliver all the skills that companies need. So more and more companies are starting to develop um, more programs that are forward thinking and looking to develop a, like more of a learning journey that has a mix of kind of core as well as individualized content and people can then use it when they need it versus these really large centralized programs that everybody has to attend annually and you tick the box that you've gotten through that for the year. But if we're going to keep in mind what we've learned during the pandemic, any learning programs that you put in place must work in the virtual environment. So what we need to see are that we need to make sure that more resilient organizations demonstrate that commitment to its workforce and ensuring that its people are engaged, that they can handle stress, that they can make decisions when they need to and manage this in this world of continuous change. So to do that, you're going to need some capabilities. One of the things you need to do is to value information and knowledge and learning. Make sure that that information, knowledge and learning is accessible, that it's understandable, and it's adequate to support the organization's objectives. Some people call this that knowledge management system. You need to understand that knowledge and information, how it's created, where it's retained, and how you can apply it through established systems and processes. The organization also needs to provide opportunities for learning and professional development and create a positive work environment. They need to show that they're committed to investing in its people. The organization also needs to understand how work occurs ensuring that those links between the work and the workplace and the workers themselves are clearly understood to build a better workplace environment and culture. They also need to make sure that learning is drawn from all available sources, that you use what you have and you learn from experience as well as from others. 
and you need to encourage the creation and sharing of lessons learned, both about success and failure, and promote the adoption of better practice. We can't have any of these strategies without talking about the importance of using data to empower all of your decisions. I think most organizations today understand that data is the business and that data should continually empower decisions as well as your value agenda and that you should be using predictive analytics and performance management to um, operate more agilely. So you need to build data rich systems to help you manage change. And those systems need to anticipate, plan, and respond to changing circumstances. You need to leverage IT operations data to help you provide insights and discovery and capacity planning. You also need to make sure that you're using an agile finance system. Finance, the finance function itself needs to become the go-to source for decision support where they can be delivering analytic insight to drive strategy and provide real-time insight into the state of the business itself. And one of the things that they're seeing in universities around the world is that finance people are going back and learning about IT and IT people are learning about finance where these are becoming two or parts of two functions of the organization that are heavily reliant upon each other. So more resilient organizations use data to inform all of their decisions and help them with forecasting and managing change. And what we're seeing is that data-driven organizations are able to automate processes to both increase agility and flexibility. So we need to seize upon data's ability to connect and scale. And these companies are, you know, if you do this, you're going to be able to develop new products and services and even businesses in more of a fast release and upgrade cycles um, to be able to do that several different times a year. So what kinds of dis capabilities do you need to have in place to empower decisions? You need to be utilizing um, artificial intelligence, intelligent automation, machine learning, and using technology as a tool to help you manage change and inform your decisions. You also need to automate anything you can, especially transactional processes, in order to provide that high degree of scalability and agility. Talent management and human resource hires, they need to hire people who are going to improve the finance function, strategic influence and management guidance, which means they're going to need to understand how to use data and how to generate data. The organization should be using centers for financial planning and analysis, centralizing some of your finance related subject matter expertise and being able to learn from each other. This is where you see a lot of silos is in the finance function itself because the organization needs to rely on the finance function to help them understand what is and what is not generating revenue. So of course, we also need in a strategy for increasing preparedness and managing risk. So a more resilient organization implements systems to anticipate, plan, and respond to changing circumstances. They develop and allocate resources such as people, premises, processes, technology, finance, and information to help address those vulnerabilities, all the while providing the ability to adapt to these changing circumstances. So part of being prepared and being able to manage risk is having adequate resources. So you need your resources to be available, to be assigned, and to be competent. So when you're looking at those different resources, they need to, you need to make sure that they're in place. And this is probably the number one place where companies fail, is that they want to do things and they commit to doing things, but they don't commit the resources to do them. And they, are they, and they maybe don't even commit the right sources to do, resources to do them. And of course we need to manage risk. So the organization needs to anticipate and respond to any threats as well as opportunities arising from those sudden or gradual changes to its internal and external context. And we know that organizational resilience is enhanced when the organization intentionally manages its risk and helps to prepare for the unexpected. And this is where the alignment and collaboration of any risk-based systems that you have is really essential. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. So what sorts of capabilities do you need in place? You need to have roles, responsibilities, and authorities assigned to competent personnel who can collaborate and communicate effectively. 
You need to have all areas of the organization that manage risk, make sure that the, it's coordinated and that they collaborate to eliminate those silos in order to operate more efficiently and effectively. You also need to manage its re, your resources in a more agile manner. So ensuring that you have the right people on the right teams at the right time. And of course, making sure that they're adequate and available when needed. So this is where you have, when you understand the expertise of your people, you can move them around as you need them to manage changing circumstances. You also need to make sure that the methods of managing risk are robust and effective, and that they are able to respond to change and uncertainty. And of course, you need to empower your people to identify and communicate threats and opportunities as well, to take action that'll benefit the organization. And the organization itself needs to identify which methods of managing risk will best meet their needs. So when you're doing that, you need to be able to respond to threats and opportunities. So let's look at some different ways you can do that. And by the way, this list is very partial and there's many ways organizations can be prepared and manage risk. But one of them is an asset management system, understanding where your assets are. Probably the most common is having a quality management system. All of these manage risk in some manner. Putting together some kind of an incident response structure that you can use for every way that you manage risk. So once a risk is identified, you have a way to respond that's consistent throughout the organization, whether it's an information or cybersecurity risk or whether it's a quality risk. You need to have in place some sort of a crisis management and communication system. You also need to have a business continuity management system. And there's lots of things that deal with safety and security. So your physical security system, you might have an environmental health and safety system, just safety all on its own. Um, so there's lots of different ways and different countries have different um, requirements for that as well. You need to be looking at supply chain resilience. What is the, the um, managing supply chain risk? making sure you've got supply chain continuity and you're looking at supply chain security as well as all one system. Too often that's being done separately. You also need to make sure you've got continuity of your information and communication technology. I don't want to hear anybody else talk about ITDR. We should be beyond disaster recovery and start looking and making sure that our information and communication technology systems can operate continually. You need a continual, continual, uh, excuse me, a con critical environment system. How do you manage your data centers, your servers, and all those systems that, that support the continuity of your information and communication technology systems? And of course, you know, you can't even go a day in the news without seeing the latest information in cybersecurity attack. So you need to make sure you have systems in place to mitigate the risk of those and make sure that you're compliant with all of those legal and regulatory requirements. And you also, of course, need to have storage and availability systems for all of the data and information that you have. These are just some, but I think this gives you kind of an idea of the extent to the ways that you need to manage risk and how you can increase your preparedness. One of the things we talked about was how your organization behaves. And this is really tied to your organization's culture, ship and culture and your leadership style. So in our organizational resilience capability assessment, we have you rate your behaviors in these different dimensions by is this behavior evident? Is it sometimes evident or is it embedded? So here, you know, if it's not evident at all, that's not a great thing. So we're looking at how adaptive and flexible are you? How resourceful, creative and innovative are you? Do you behave in an inclusive and collaborative way? Are you prepared? Are, are your systems robust and redundant? Do you take time to be aware and reflective? And do you operate and, and hire people in a diverse and integrated manner? And, and do those people allowed to um, communicate within your organization? And so these behaviors are the ones that we bundled together to say that in order to support an organizational resilient strategy, you need to behave and show that, it, that at least these behaviors are sometimes evident and try to work towards making them embedded as part of who you are and what you do, making these behaviors part of your corporate culture. So the question is, what is your resilience strategy? We know that nobody can predict exactly what, what might go wrong, but we know that 
something will and that things will continue to go wrong. And so we need to plan for that. And, um, you know, when we looked at all those different ways that you can prepare and manage risk, you know, which one of those systems do you find that you're weakest in? Can you help, can your strategy be to improve some of those strategies to manage risk? Do you need to focus on your culture? Do you need to focus on your workforce? Where is it that you're the weakest so that you can try to reduce some of the vulnerabilities that you have within your own systems? So back in 2014, um, Harvard Business Review identified five components of resilient systems. And one of the things, obviously I think there's been learning since 2014, but I also don't think they were totally off the mark. And so they defined a resilient system as one that reduced the impact of threats and volatility. And I would argue that this is probably more aligned to what we're calling operational resilience versus organizational resilience, but they just looked at resilient systems. So one of the things that they identified is that your company needs to be diverse. So you need to sell more than one product, more than one service or technology. You need to make sure you have more than one supplier and any other core elements. You need to make sure you can diversify as much as possible. You also need to um, make sure you've got redundancy and buffers in place. And this is kind of looking at those layers of redundancy that are more central um, to risk management. Things like, you know, what's happened, what's being you know, promoted more recently is, you know, being more lean and all of this. And a lot of times that creates um, a lot of risk to the organization because you don't have the ability to be redundant. You should have a love-hate relationship with risk, meaning, you know, you're trying to keep the business as safe as possible, but you also need to take some risks and maybe you know with some parts smaller parts of the organization to be able to grow and it is kind of a paradoxical paradoxical idea but we're looking at you know how do you build resilience how do you strengthen your weak areas and you can't do that if you don't talk about risk and so this is where it's really important to that's where they talk about kind of that love hate piece where you have to acknowledge that risk exists and you have to talk about it you also need fast feedback as well as failure. You need to be responsive. And so you need to have, again, we talked about data on resource use. What are your risks up and down your value chain? And so you also need to invest in capturing information and building some real-time systems so that you have in place data that you can drive decisions on. And this is something that was, has been repeated over and over again over the years. And then I've been talking about being as flat as you can. So looking at you know, doing, being as modular and distributed in your design as possible so that if some part of your system fails, you know, you can um, leverage some of the other parts. Just a really stupid story. It's, it's hard to, you wouldn't have built this scenario because nobody would have believed it. But back in August of 2003, sort of in, in the area where I live, um, in Ohio, a tree branch hit a power line. Well, I guess that doesn't happen every day, does it? But for some reason, there was a weakness in that system. And this, it caused a cascading failure across the highly connected US grid and 50 million people in the Northeast lost power. For some of those people, they lost power for weeks as they had to rebuild this entire grid. And so, you know, we know that we need to be, you know, being better prepared, but we also need to realize Interconnectedness is good, but can also serve as a weakness if we're so interconnected that we can't stop something from cascading from, from a small problem to a big problem. So the question is, you know, if nothing else, we need a resilient strategy in order to survive the change. We saw 2020 as a year of change, but I see 2021 as even a year of more change. And we're asking people to change again as we start talking about returning to the workplace and returning, you know, starting to operate more as usual. And what is that going to mean? And, and, and what does that look like? There was a really interesting study published in February of 2020. So as we're all starting to say, you know, pre-pandemic, but this was a study done by nurses to explore the concept of resilience in the nursing workforce, because one of the things that they were seeing was that there was so much stress for the nurses that there was too much turnover and they weren't actually able to operate their hospitals effectively. And so what they were trying to do is figure out, 
can we implement resilience training for nurses to help them um, pr to be protected against the negative effects of a lot of the stress that's being caused in the workplace itself, just due to the job itself that they have, as well as by the frequent changes. And so one of the things that they identified is that frequent changes in an organization can lead to what's called change resistance or change fatigue. And I think we're all there. You know, change resistance is this actual intentional disruptive behavior used to sabotage change. I'm just going to say that I think we're all too tired to resist change right now, and we're all in the place of change fatigue. And part of the output of change fatigue is that um, people become disengaged, and they become apathetic, and they just, they're not openly expressing their dissent. They just don't care anymore. And so they're so fatigued that they can't move on. And this is part of what we need to consider as we start thinking about our workforce and, and getting people back to work. So change can, fatigue can lead to an overwhelming feeling of stress and exhaustion and workplace burnout. And it can really affect the employee's overall health and well-being as well. So some of the symptoms include things like anger and anxiety. Of course, we've mentioned stress and frustration. And what we know is that employees who are negatively, negatively affected by change are more likely to report stress and emotional exhaustion. And they're also less likely to trust their employer. Remember, we started with this by the importance of being able to trust who you work for. And so there, this results in them being more likely to leave the organization really within a year. They've actually documented that that is a quick change. So researchers have also found that constant change within an organization leads to an increase in sick time, um, an increase in turnover rates, um, a decrease in productivity, as well as organizational commitment and that job satisfaction, which is so important to keeping people. So looking at this idea of personal resilience and understanding that it's a process that allows individuals to access resources to cope with and recover from adversity, we know that it can be learned. And we know the more experience and success people have with stress regulation, that the more you're equipped to deal with future stressors. So it's something that builds upon success. And so there's been a growing interest in building employee resilience. And there's been other studies done as well that have reported the positive effects of resilience training. And the findings indicate that resilience training can really help improve resilience. Hey, the key factor is reducing that stress and promoting that overall employee well-being, which keeps people um, and, and makes them more productive. So one of the things that they did in this nursing training program is that they taught the nurses to recognize their stress symptoms. So what are those triggers that they might have? And then they taught them skills to counteract some of the negative effects of that stress, including the opportunity to use things like heart rate variability feedback, which of course you're in a hospital setting that you're gonna trust equipment that helps you regulate your body itself. And what they found was that this intervention promoted positive strategies for both coping and enhancing well-being, both professionally and, and organizationally because these people didn't leave and they became more productive and less fatigued. So I think that's something that we're going to need to consider as well as we've talked about other, you know, employee well-being programs are becoming something that's more of a norm in organizations. And so looking at how can you help people manage stress might be a topic that needs to be considered within those employee wellness programs. Something I just wanted to remind you of that we've, that we've um, talked about in the, um, more recently, but the impact of the pandemic on employing well-being. In the United States, they've reported 75% of people have reported symptoms of burnout, 33% in the Asia Pacific area, and, of, and European nations also are reporting increasing levels of pandemic fatigue. One of the th key findings is that the number of those who rate their mental health as very poor is more than three times higher than before the pandemic. So we know there's work out there to be done and you cannot expect your people just to come back and, and jump in as they were before. So just a reminder of what burnout looks like, you know, you're gonna have lowered energy, the sense of being overwhelmed, really being more negative than you might normally be and just saying, nope, not doing that today. I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not going to be thinking about anything new. And I think all of us feel that way sometimes. But the problem is this pandemic has gone on for so long that we're really feeling people that maybe haven't felt stress before are feeling stress for the first time. And those that do feel stress are feeling very overwhelmed. 
So understanding that burnout is really not the present, presence of big negatives. We can get over big things, but it's sometimes the absence of positives that, that drag on. And so we know also that a distinct casualty of burnout is creativity. And it's really rare that saturated people or professionals can just muster the actual energy to generate fresh, fresh ideas and perspectives. So because you're spending all your energy on just coping, you really have little left for exploration and innovation. And so this is why this is something that organizations are going to need to consider. So if you missed the January webinar on burnout and fatigue, you can find it on our YouTube channel. And we also looked at how to, you know, how to return your workforce um, in our May webinar as well. Um, we, we encourage you to take a look at um, the McKenzie article or paper on um, organizing for the future. There's also that more dated HBR um, article, but I think it's actually still practical. And then that study, if you want to take a look at more in depth on that study that the nursing management did, um, it's in the Journal of Nursing Management. And of course, we encourage you to get to know and learn about our organizational resilience model. And our capability assessment is going online, um, I believe today as we speak, the marketing is being worked on. So we have taken that tool and made it an online assessment. We want to invite you to attend. Um, we have an upcoming webinar by a guest speaker, Intertech, um, on Monday. So looking at information security in that work from home area. We'll be looking at learning programs and, and, and really building your capabilities in July. In August, we're going to be looking at, uh, again, how you, can you be more agile and adaptive and flexible. In September, we're going to be looking at this idea of individual purpose and, and how that helps you to manage these, some of these uncertainties that come along, as, including the post-pandemic. In October, we're going to look at risk culture and how that impacts your operational resilience. In November, looking at your risk to your global value chains. And in December, we're gonna to return to one of our favorite topics, which is how culture shapes behavior and how you can build more resilient organizations. So thank you for attending today. I will um, answer all of the questions. I, since it's just three minutes left, I'm going to stop there to um, respect your time for those 60 minutes. But um, when we send out your certificates, um, we will answer all of the questions, including those questions that were um, provided before the webinar itself. We encourage you to read our newsletter and follow us. You know, we have our LinkedIn and our Facebook and our YouTube channel. Um, we encourage you to follow us. I have to say, we don't really do much on Twitter. So, um, you know, if you're a Twitter person, you might not find us very active there. So thank you for your time today, and we hope to see you back on Monday.